The Faroe Islands are an archipelago roughly halfway between Iceland to the west and Norway to the east. Scotland lies some 320 kilometers to the south, and today the islands belong to Denmark. It's possible the first inhabitants here were Irish monks seeking seclusion away from secular society by sailing off into the misty seas of the north. The Norse were the first recorded inhabitants, however, arriving on the islands at some point in the latter part of the 8th century when they developed the sail. Sources from later in the Middle Ages name Grimir Cambon as the first Norseman to emigrate to the Faroe Islands, though they disagree about when this occurred. Later, it may well have been settlers from here who helped in the early raids against coastal monasteries in Britain and Ireland, and later still in the discovery and settlement of Iceland. Many of them might also have come from the Hiberno-Norse colonies, such as those on Orkney and Shetland, the Outer Hebrides, and perhaps the long forts and towns of Ireland. The Furinga saga also mentions that Norwegians, disgruntled with the rule of Harald Hairfair, also, or Fairhair, also left for the islands in the early 10th century. Note that this saga has been lost to time, that's the Furinga saga, the saga of the Faroese, though snippets of it still remain in other Icelandic manuscripts from which we can learn about the Faroe Islands' early inhabitants. The saga mentions that at a place called Tinganes, today the capital Torshaun, the Althing was established and law was spoken whereby all freemen had the right to meet. The word thinge is the Old Norse word for such a meeting place, and it's today the name of the Faroe Islands Parliament, which is situated at the same site. Archaeology from the Faroes revealed that the most common animals to be kept were sheep and goats, and indeed the name Faroe means sheep islands or livestock islands in Old Norse. Pigs and cows were also kept, though in smaller numbers. It's likely that sheep and goats were hardy enough to be kept out of byres and in pasture year-round with their thick coats, while pigs and cattle would need to be kept inside in the colder months. The reliance on the land is indicated in the toponymy of the pharaohs, with Akraberg being the cereal field mountain and Hoivjuk denoting the Bay of Hay. Bowls and other wooden objects found in archaeological layers show that they utilised local tree species as well as basalt and tufa for their basic needs. It's clear from midden remains that the settlers of Junkarins Flottur frequently ate puffins and other native seabirds. When I was in the Faroe Islands, I tried salted fulmar, and I can't say I was a huge fan. The closest analogy would probably be with trying to eat an old leather shoe sole drenched in salty water. Not the best. A fun side note is that fulmar is one of the only Faroese loan words into English, I believe alongside skewer, both of which are names of seabirds. And for everyone looking it up right now, yes, it's a seabird, and no, it isn't a gull. A farm dating back to the Viking Age has been excavated at Kvivjuk on Stremoy. The farmstead consisted of a longhouse right next to the shore of the bay. Remains of a byre were found next to the longhouse and would have housed the farmer's cattle during the winter months. This settlement typology is similar to what is found at Viking Age sites in Norway. The site of Toftanes on the island of Eysturoy provides other insights. The name Toft already indicated to the local inhabitants there may have been a Viking Age site there, as in Old Norse the term means farm. Just as like at Kvivjuk, a longhouse was discovered, though at Toftanes its walls were still intact, showing it was made of stones and earth and being some 1.5 metres thick. The structure in total measured some 20 by 5 metres. The byre was attached to the longhouse's eastern wall. On the northern side of the house, the remains were discovered with evidence of burn layers, indicating it may have been used for stoking fires. Spindle walls for making nets and weights for sinking them have also been found, suggesting part of their diet was based on maritime resources such as fish. The site is perfectly situated to take advantage of passing shoals, but also by a calmer part of the bay where launching and beaching boats was easy. Lamps that burnt cod liver oil also demonstrate how the inhabitants of Toftanes utilised different parts of the animal they caught for different purposes. At Sandavogur on the island of Vogur, a rune stone was discovered in 1917. Its inscription reading in Old Norse, Thorkel Unundar Sonder, Austmother af Rogalandi, Bugvithena Stathfurst, which translates to Thorkel Onundar's son, man of the east from Rogaland, lived in this place first. This again shows us the close relations between the early Faroese and Norway, as Rogaland is a region in western Norway. 
Thorkel may therefore have been one of the first early settlers and explorers to have come from Norway to make a new home for himself in the Faroe Islands and erected a monument here. However, the phase of Norse and typology of the runes indicates that the stone was carved in the 13th century, suggesting the inhabitation of the Faroe Islands probably occurred in stages, with some areas being settled towards the end of the 8th century and others only being inhabited centuries later. While many of the early inhabitants of the Faroes were clearly Norwegians, the Irish connection shouldn't be underestimated. Even the first named settler, Grimer Kambon, has an Irish epithet, perhaps suggesting he was of mixed Norse Gaelic descent and from one of the colonies around the Irish Sea region. Ethnonyms of Ostmen, meaning Eastmen, for Norwegians, and Vestman, meaning Westmen, for those from Scotland and Ireland, survives in the Faroese toponymy in places like Vestmanahoun and Vestmanear, which means uh, the harbour of the Westmen and the island of the Westmen, which indicates people from Ireland and Scotland. We might assume the same for the Faroe Islands as the situation in Iceland, where the mitochondrial DNA of modern women shows a large proportion of the original female population came from either Ireland or Scotland. Indeed, many Gaelic words have survived into modern Faroese. Some examples are black or blathak, meaning buttermilk, drunner, meaning tail, grukr, meaning head, glaumer, meaning paw or hand, tarver, meaning bull, and erge, meaning pasture. The location of the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic Ocean made it an ideal stopping point for Norse mariners going to other Norse colonies around the Irish Sea, Eastern Britain and beyond to Iceland, Greenland, and even North America. Contact through trade was maintained with Norway, particularly in order to fulfill demand for wood, which likely would have soon run out after an initial period of deforestation following settlement. Soapstone also came from Norway and was used for bowls and saucepans. Communities in Sander also imported grains from Norway, as has been seen in the archaeological record. Trade also went westward to the Norse colonies in Iceland. It also went south across the Atlantic to other Norse colonies in Britain and Ireland, as evidenced by finds of Hiberno-Norse ringpins and a Jewish bracelet from the Irish Sea region that has been found at Toftanes. There is even evidence of trade beyond the peripheries of the Norse world. The remains of nutshells have been found at several sites, suggesting there was a large import market for this foodstuff as nuts aren't naturally found in the Faroes. A woman's shoe from Kvivyuk has been found bearing strong resemblance to such a shoe found in Paris. Pearl necklaces also provide an insight into the attire of higher class women in Norse Faroese society. Wooden horse and boat toys also give us a glimpse into the lives of children growing up in Viking Age Faroe Islands. The end of the settlement period of the Faroe Islands is usually considered with regard to two major developments, the conversion to Christianity and the incorporation into the Kingdom of Norway. While the islands officially converted around 1000 AD, the same time as Iceland's lawmaker famously decided to become Christian along with the entire island as well, Evidence from Tostanes of wooden crosses modelled on Irish and Scottish examples suggests that some of the earlier inhabitants were already Christian. Quite possibly these were those very same Gaelic-speaking peoples who had been brought over from places in Britain and Ireland, though they also may have been Hiberno-Norse or mixed peoples who were already Christian at the time. It was after a series of feuding between the Northern Islanders and the Southern ones that Sigmundur Brestison fled to Norway following the annihilation of his Southern family at the expense of the Northerners and became the sworn man of King Olaf Tryggvason, the King of Norway. He was a proselytizing Christian king and under his instruction Sigmundur returned with Norwegian backing and imposed Christianity on the Islanders as well as Norwegian hegemony. The Diocese of the Faroe Islands was established and based at Churchibur, the name denoting the settlement of the church. A relative of one of these bishops called Ro would eventually become King Sverre of Norway, and he would be raised in the Faroe Islands. Thanks everyone so much for watching. So this week and a half, almost two weeks, I've been away in the Netherlands. I've been going to conferences. I was in Friesland for a bit and I was down visiting relatives, family and friends before the next stage in my own academic journey. As such, I didn't have time for a 
proper video, but I was flying back today and had a few hours at the airport, so I put this video together with some information that I could find on the Vikings in the Faroe Islands, with in the background some of the images that I took when I was lucky enough to visit the Faroe Islands myself in the summer of 2020, helping my father on a research trip of a different nature. But I hope you've enjoyed the video, let me know what you thought, and next week I'll be back with a normal video. All the best until then, I've been Hilbert and this has been The History.